Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of the Agroforestry series. This webinar is entitled Agroforestry and USDA Funding, and we will be having a Q&A with members of an expert panel. This webinar took place on March 27, 2024, but you're watching the recording of it here on YouTube. Before we get started, I just want to introduce the partners that have come together to help put on this webinar that is generously sponsored by the EPA. The first is the Delta Institute that collaborates with communities across the Midwest to solve complex environmental challenges. Uh, their work takes them to cities like Chicago, St. Louis, and Milwaukee, as well as the greater agricultural communities in rural areas throughout those states. And they're focused on a integrated approach to environmental, economic, and social changes. And we're excited to partner with the Delta Institute to help see how agroforestry can help support water quality as well as environmental benefits. The next partner is the Liberty Prairie Foundation um, based out of Grays Lake, Illinois, who are focused on ways that farming and sustainable food systems can help boost our community well-being as well as uh, integrate into our educational systems. And the last partner is the Savannah Institute. We're the organizing partner of this webinar series, and we're a nonprofit organization based in Champaign and Madison, Wisconsin, that helps lay the groundwork for widespread agroforestry adoption here in the Midwest. Now, we mentioned agroforestry um, as the uniting factor of this webinar. And to provide a simple definition, agroforestry is the integrated approach to farming with trees and livestock that has multiple benefits. We're interested in trees on farm because they can both adapt to and mitigate climate change, as well as produce healthy food, clean, provide clean air and wildlife habitat, diversify farm income, as well as purifying water, sequestering carbon, and preventing erosion. When we talk about agroforestry, we mostly talk about five main practices that are supported by the USDA. The first is alley cropping, which is the cultivation of crops in the alleys between regularly spaced rows of trees and shrubs. So that can be grain production, like we're seeing here in this illustration, could be vegetables or cut florals, any sort of production that's happening in between rows of trees. The second practice supported by the USDA is silvopasture. And this is the intentional integration of trees, pasture, and livestock that are managed as a single system. Silvopasture can be silvopasture by addition, where we add trees into existing pasture, or silvopasture by subtraction, where we're taking woodlands and enhancing the woodland health, as well as the pasture health underneath by integrating livestock in a very intentional and managed manner. The third are riparian buffers, specifically woody riparian buffers, and these are strips of permanent vegetation along streams, lakes, wetlands, ponds that help protect that water, keep soil in place, and enhance the biodiversity of that place. The fourth are windbreaks, which are strips of trees and shrubs that are on the edges of farmlands designed to enhance crop or livestock production while also providing multiple conservation benefits. These were once ubiquitous on our landscape and we're hoping to bring them back through our work and partnerships. And the last one is forest farming. Depending where you are, this might be something that's more popular or if you're like me and from East Central Illinois, you might see this less. But forest farming is the cultivation, of especially crops like mushroom or ginseng, uh, things like ramps or blood or cohosh under existing forest canopy. So utilizing the, the forest as a place to produce food. Our panel today is a great mix of folks from both the federal, the state, and the local level. We have John Williams, who is the farm manager from Sola Gradia Farm, Jamie Jones, the Illinois Outreach Coordinator um, at NRCS, Alan Braun, the Wisconsin NRCS State Forester, and Kate McFarland, who is an agroforester at the USDA National Agroforestry Center. And this panel of experts all have experience working within USDA programs at the local, state, and federal level. Unfortunately, during the live portion of this webinar, um, we had some technical difficulties. And so you're going to miss the first part where folks are introducing themselves. Um, but the webinar is now going to continue at the beginning of the Q&A, and I highly encourage you to go back and learn more about each of our panelists. Enjoy.
Um, actually, Alan, your last comment connects to a question we've received from Wade, uh, who's asking, how do we teach our local and RCS staff about agroforestry? Um, he's sharing that, in particular in central Iowa, the farmers seem to be better educated than some of the NRCS agents. And I would kind of ex extend that question to how can people get involved in um, reviewing some of the, the practice standards or supporting NRCS funding for agroforestry? Sure. Yeah. So um, basically in Wisconsin, how we're going about making sure our field offices are, are better equipped is it's a range of things. Um, so those guidance documents I mentioned, those are those could be just as easily used by our field offices to educate themselves um, as a as a private landowner. Uh, we are also starting to put on trainings in partnership with Savannah Institute for our field office folks. Um, so that they can be, uh, you know, just have more knowledge on these practices. We just had a training in the southern part of the state here uh, earlier this month, and we're going to follow that up with a field day at some of the Savannah Institute farms um, so folks can see that those things on the ground. So we're working on training folks and making sure that they at least have some background knowledge uh, on these practices. Um, as far as getting involved in different states, um, you know, typically how we get uh, input from private landowners is going to be through our, our technical committees. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I, that Savannah Institute has reps on our state technical committee here in Wisconsin. So probably the best way is to, um, I probably would be to have a somewhat umbrella type of agroforestry organization that can sit on that state technical committee and um, basically take uh, private landowner feedback and and get it um, to NRCS that way. I don't know, Jamie, if you have other thoughts on that. Yeah, um, definitely echo what you said, Alan. Um, in addition to that, um, some if you're if you have a relationship with your local field office, your NRCS field office, which there should be one in about every county. I know in Illinois, it's almost every county, and then you know most counties across the nation. But um, find your local field office if you don't already work with them. And sometimes some of them have a local work group, which could be a representation of some farmers, or it could even be like you know co-op application people. It could be just a variety of people involved in ag in that community. And those local work groups can provide information or needs, or if it's county-based or tri-county-based, like priorities, if there's a specific watershed they want to protect. But all that to say, if there's definite um, concerns, they can be brought up through local work groups. Another way would be through state technical committee. Um, like Alan said, I'm having a representative on that committee because that one looks at a lot of you know information that we provide, or maybe it's information we need to provide, or maybe it's a different way funding needs to go. Um, so they do have input on those decisions. Um, I guess one more thing would be, which is a great point, especially for those getting started in farming or maybe even smaller scale, complete the ag census. Completing the ag census and, and identifying your operation um, tells the government basically that there is a demand in a need, whether it be agroforestry um, or your small scale. And whenever they can count those farms and see there's that need, then that tells Congress and other entities there's, you know, there's there's a need there to put money towards that. If nobody shows up as having small farms or having that need, then less money gets allocated towards that. And that's one way, I guess, on a large scale, the NRCS would get money towards things. I'll just um, build on what Jamie said. Thanks for mentioning the, the ag census. There is one question in there related to asking whether you practice agroforestry. And so that's, as, as she said so clearly, like that's a great place to indicate what kind of farm you are and what you're doing and what you're excited about is, is through that census, even though um, it's only every five years, but it's still, still useful. And as others said, I think um, those guidance documents that are in the field office technical guides can be so useful. At the National Agroforestry Center, we also have a good number of resources, both technical and more general, on agroforestry that, that sometimes can be useful in, in starting the conversation. Um, 
And yeah, I think for what I hear from from other states, not not on this call today, um, whether it's a local work group or or just being aware of the state technical committee and and learning a little bit about that and and sharing interest there can all be effective ways to get get more agroforestry integrated um, and share information. John, do you have anything to share about your experience working with your state, um, your local office, and uh, learning about agroforestry together? Um, I, I think I, I mentioned it earlier, but, you know, I, I think one thing to, like, the Champaign office is, is a very, has a number of friend, very friendly staff there that um, have worked through our programming. Um, but, you know, I, I do want to say that uh, when we started this, they, you know, there was a lot of, um, a lot of work that they had to do in terms of getting themselves up to speed on on the different practices so like it it it's not that i went in and they instantly knew alley cropping and you know all these all these programs that we ended up or all these practices we ended up looping into our rcpp program or contract um but there you know there was definitely a like hey you know we we see all these things that could fall under this you know, can you help us like navigate and see what would work for us that we would be eligible for? And, and then they, you know, they went back and, and did their work and uh, came back and, and said, you know, okay, the, these practices work and these practices aren't going to, you know, aren't going to, you're not going to be eligible for and whatnot. So um, it, it wasn't me going in there right away and them being um, fully up to speed on all those agroforestry practices. Thank you, John. And actually, that kind of links to my next question. Um, you said you went to your NRCS office. What is it like to apply for funding for agroforestry? Do you have to work with a technical service provider to design your system? So um, you don't have to. Um, you know, I I did not go through the TSP program that Savannah Institute has. Um, Officially, uh, I got a lot of help and knowledge from uh, Katie Adams, who happens to be my wife. <laughs> so, so there was a lot of uh, knowledge and and back and forth and um, game planning there um, and and support. Uh, I I would recommend it. Um, you know, I would recommend exploring the TSP program um, as as an avenue to to bolster your your knowledge to get into it, but um, you know, the, the practices do have a lot of guidance that, um, you know, get you a, a good bit of the way there in terms of like tree spacing and, um, you know, what you can and can't do in, in those programs. So um, while I while I didn't officially do it, I, I would recommend it for for most everyone um, to, to make sure that you get a system that works really well for your farm and your operation. In, in in Wisconsin, we have partnered with Savannah Institute as well to uh, offer more uh, in-depth te technical service um, than probably our field offices can offer right now. So uh, we have uh, a couple employees, uh, well, partner employees through Savannah Institute that, that are agroforestry focused and um, I guess you could say two and a half. I guess there's there's uh, Caleb we kind of share with Minnesota. So, um, uh, yeah, it's I think it's a great opportunity. The Savannah Institute folks are very knowledgeable on these different practices. Um, but, you know, with that said, you could go either way. You can start with Savannah Institute or you can go into a field office and um, see what they know there. Uh, they can also, the field office folks can also call Savannah Institute and, and get them involved on the project. So there's a couple different ways to go there. Great. Thank you, Alan. I have uh, a question from Samantha in the chat that I think connects to this quite well. Um, do you have any examples where farmers have wanted to try agroforestry and couldn't, uh, who tried it and maybe stopped? What are some of the challenges they faced, uh, particularly in working with those programs?
So that's a good question. And I don't typically work one-on-one -on -one with landowners much at my level. So I, I don't necessarily hear of everything that, that happens out there. If, if Matt Wilson was on this call, he could probably answer this with, without any problem. Um, but I think sometimes, um, you know, the challenges out there are, this is a change potentially to, to your existing system. And until you know ever, you know, everything that needs to go into it, um, you might not be able to to make that decision on if it's something you actually want to do or not, because it's it is going to it's it's going to change um, potentially your your cropping systems and equipment and uh, the time of, you know, the, just the amount of work you need to put into to doing these things. So that's always something to, to think about. Um, sometimes just the cost of doing these things, even with cost share assistance, um, you know, it's our cost share assistance with NRCS gets paid after the project's completed. So you still have to front some of those, you know, a good bit of those costs and, you know, pl planting trees and mulching and doing all those kinds of good tending type of practices that, that can be fairly expensive. So I think that can be a challenge. Um, and then sometimes just having markets available to to sell some some of the products you're thinking of. Um, you know, if, if it's not there already or in development, that that can be a challenge too, um, depending on how much you need to count on on those trees or or shrubs that you're adding for for income as well. But yeah, I don't know if. Um, John or Kate or Jamie, if you got some other thoughts on that. Um, to add to one of your comments, Alan, about the upfront cost being expensive. Um, and I know Savannah Institute does a really good job of explaining that too, because with trees, we have you know a longer wait for return than we do for corn and things like that. Um, for those producers um, who count as you know historically underserved, so you could be a beginning farmer um, you haven't ever registered with USDA or done anything with farming on taxes, et cetera. If you're a beginning farmer, you know, socially disadvantaged, we have some different um, criteria. If you meet one of those and you get financial assistance through EQIP, so our Fix It program, um, you can sometimes get an advanced payment. So you can get 50% of the cost up front. You do have a timeline to implement that practice. Um, so there, there, there is some flexibility there and if your field office is good at working with you for like CSP, the conservation stewardship program, which I said rewards you for what you're already doing and then helps you encourage you to do better. Um, there are some ways with that if they explain it to you in some planning that maybe you could use some of the money that you earn for doing what you're already doing to put towards your practices, you know, the next the next year. I'm always happy to explain that more and hopefully, you know, our field offices are able to again help you navigate and understand what may be your best fit. But I don't know any specific instances of people that have failed and gotten away from it. Um, I've mostly worked um, individually with um, a, some alley cropping um, and like the the ones where I talk about like crop and uh, tree integration. So alley cropping and silvopasture pasture have been the two main ones I've done. Repairing buffers. I mean, a lot of people do those. Um, that's an easier sell of the agroforestry practices in the parts of the state I've worked in. I feel like Jamie and Alan's comments were so so thoughtful and so spot on. Um, I definitely hear sometimes from farmers who who have done agroforestry and decided it's not the right fit for them, or or just run into a lot of barriers trying to get started in agroforestry. And I think it's really important that as an agroforestry community, we we recognize that agroforestry isn't going to be the right fit for every farm or every farmer. Right? This is a this is a opportunity, and NRCS takes a great perspective in thinking about a conservation plan, right? And what are the co combination of practices that fit together to meet your goals? And it's I work for the Agroforestry Center. Of course, I'm excited when agroforestry fits in there, but that doesn't mean it's always the right solution. And so I think um, that's definitely um, in some ways it's 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 showing that we're working through the process well. And so there's a lot to learn from that, try and make that assistance easier to access for sure. Um, and and learn from those people who, who tried it out and it wasn't a good fit for them. So those are more conversations to be had, absolutely.
And I'll, I'll add kind of my perspective. I, I mean, I haven't necessarily seen anyone in my farming circles that have abandoned agroforestry uh, practices, but, you know, some things to consider that have been challenges, um, you know, are, are the, you know, the upfront purchasing of trees and, and other, you know, all that work and then getting paid after the fact um, that does cause some challenges. Uh, I mean, I'm, fortunate to work for a, an organization that can, you know, cover that, but I would imagine that would be um, a bit more of a challenge if I was uh, like an owner operator. Um, uh, in in part with that, our RCPP uh, contract is multi-year. It's, well, it's, it's going to become a five-year contract. It started out as a four-year contract. Um, and uh, after the first year, we uh, realized we needed to kind of adjust that contract to, to better fit what we were able to do. Um, and so we're in the process of adjusting, uh, some things out of our first year into, to the, uh, second year and, and so forth. And there has been some delays in, in getting that contract update to, to happen. And, and I know I've been in communication with our office and, there's no concern that it's not going to happen. It's it's more waiting on, um, I think, some background program programming to um, get fixed so they can adjust that contract. So um, so there has been a, a more than expected delay on repayment on our, our first year of that contract work. Um, and then, you know, I, I think um, another challenge that needs to, you know, has, have a lot of forethought in terms of designing these systems for your farm is um, designing it to work with the equipment you have, the equipment you plan on having, and and considering the the tree growth over the years. Um, you know, I my my system is is set up uh, in part because of you know bed widths of um, you know our vegetable production and our tractors and some other equipment like our, our boom sprayer and stuff. So it, it's, it's very much sized out to, to fit that equipment. Um, and then also considering, you know, that I know, you know, five years from now that I'm going to have a little bit less vegetable growing space when the, the apple trees get bigger um, kind of things too. So uh, I think that that's some of the, the bigger challenges that I've, I've seen so far with, um, NRCS programming. Thank you all for your insight. For the next question, I'm going to try to merge together two questions in the in the chat. One from Carl and one from Dylan. Um, and my question for you is: um, Can you tell us more about who are those programs for and how you communicate about them? And then is there a preference given um, to existing farms that are trying to transition into agroforestry versus farms that are just establishing in agroforestry? Uh, and I don't know if anybody in particular wants to take this on. Oh, Jamie, go ahead. Yeah, um, no, no preference um, is if you're just starting to work with us or have worked with us a long time, there's no preference there. Um, and then the other part about um, how do how do people know? Um, was that right, Barbara? How do people know about NRCS? Um, so you don't have to be, you know, a farmer with cropland to be able to work with us. NRCS can help anybody that's associated with land. So either you own it, or maybe you have some sort of agreement to operate it, which means like a lease, or you're renting the land. Um, so, for example, with NRCS's push towards new farmer. So again, that just means people who have never worked with us or new customers. Um, and then our push towards um, even doing a better job at serving smaller scale. Um, so you could be even a small rural lot or a small urban lot where you're wanting to do alley cropping, things like that. Um, just as long as you can prove you have control of the land. Um, and we can talk about that, you know, more if you need to, but um, just, just to make sure that, you know, if you're wanting to put something on land, do something with land that you have the proper permission in place to do so. Because I know you wouldn't want somebody just to come start planting trees in your backyard if you didn't necessarily want them and you didn't give them permission. So that's basically NRCS and the Farm Service Agency, our sister agency's way of just making sure you, you have real control of the land before you do our practices. 
um, but they're for um, anybody to come talk to us. Um, how do people know? That's part of my job. That's part of my job in Illinois to go around and talk to different groups. Um, word of mouth. Um, we do finally have a Facebook page. We were only allowed on Twitter, now X in the past, but NRCS now has a Facebook page. Um, their meme game is strong at times. I'm really proud of them. So I'm glad to see that finally. So, um, but again, I mean, reach out. Um, that, you know, getting the word out is part of it. And I know that was mentioned by a couple of the other, um, you know, in this teleconference webinar so far was, you know, how do people know where to go? How do they know what to do? It is confusing, but again, just at least now you have a couple faces and a couple contacts to reach out to. There is on the uh, outreach side, um, the public relations folks and Jamie, I assume this probably happens in Illinois as well, but they, they put out um, little news uh, briefs and I believe you can get signed up to receive those and that'll kind of keep you up to date with what's going on with NRCS. Uh, and I'll pop into the chat here, the Wisconsin page of where you can see some of those news items. Thank you, Alan. For the next question, I'm um, going to expand on Carl's question, who was asking if anyone has worked with biological brush control practice. And I'm actually going to stretch it a little bit and say, um, what other practice standards other than straight up agroforestry practices can be used to fund the implementation of agroforestry systems. Um, and Jamie, do you want to get us started on that answer maybe? I can, yeah, and I'm sure Alan will be fine on this. So as far as agroforestry systems, um, so let's say, let's give the example of silvopasture. If you want silvopasture, um, you come in and you ask for that specifically, that's your interest. That's where your field office should be able to look at what you're already doing, look at what you wish to do, um, make a plan with you, and then say, here's all the great things information can provide, or NRCS can provide information and maybe even money for. So let's give the example of a civil pasture system. We would, could help with things like tree, um, let's see, like site preparation, so getting the site ready to plant trees. Um, the tree and shrub establishment, so the actually planting of trees. Now, remember, like the one practice you came in about was silvopasture. And we can also do things with, um, let's say, like this would be a grazing system. So in Illinois, we can look at, do you need fence, exterior fence or interior fence somewhere to help rotate the cattle? Um, could be watering system, so an actual way to water your livestock, pipeline to get water to the livestock, pasture and hayland seedings, um, there's a lot that goes with it. If it's, if it's alley cropping, you come in and ask for, you know, we could have things with, again, with like the site preparation, tree establishment, um, crop rotation, um, cover crops, nutrient management, pest management. Um, with some of our tree practices, we'll have like pruning as a management um, towards that. So there's, there's a lot depending on what you come in with. So even, you know, if you you come in asking about, like I said, the one thing like civil pasture or or alley cropping um, or repairing forest buffer. Usually there's a lot of things that NRCS can talk to you. Some of them are just supporting practices that make the practice you asked for happen. And sometimes other ones are ones that would go good with it to help. So if you wanted like additional pollinator habitat um, around your, your trees. So that's, Alan, if you have anything to add with that. Yeah. I, you we're doing a lot with tree planting in these agroforestry practices. So some of those supporting practices we see fairly often are uh, what we call tree and shrub site preparation. So uh, really important when you're planting trees to make sure you're, you're making, making the ground ready for them. Um, it's, it's going to make that tree a lot happier and, and more successful. So uh, site preparation could be things like, um, you know, doing, doing several tillage passes in the roads where you want to plant trees, you know, in, in a band, or uh, could be that you have to control grass. Maybe you have to use some grass specific herbicides to control some grass in the spots you want to plant trees. Uh, there, there's varying methods there. Uh, another common one we see uh, associated with the tree planting is mulching. So we have um, 
we have uh, options for wood chip mulch or um, uh, tree mats or uh, tree uh, weed fabric, basically, um, type of mulching systems. So um, those are those are pretty common uh, supporting practices there. And as far as um, I think the, Barbara, you asked about was it biological control of brush management. Um, yeah, it's that's not something we're really doing in Wisconsin. Um, you know that that can mean a couple different things. That can either mean uh, um, introduction of uh, of different insects or diseases that might target the uh, the brush of uh, that um, uh, that is imported from other places, and that has to undergo really rigorous testing, usually. Uh, APHIS, USDA APHIS does a lot of testing on that before you could release something. And so we don't really get involved with that because there's there's just too, too much um, uh, really technical specialty that needs to happen there. And usually state agencies get involved as well and they'll do those releases. And it's not usually something a private landowner would do on their own. Uh, biological control can also mean things like um, using grazing to try to control brush. And uh, that's not something we're necessarily engaged with uh, from the standpoint that um, you have something that grazes the top of a brush species, it's gonna re-sprout. And really what you need to do is you need to kill the roots somehow. So that could either be like a cut stump herbicide application, or it might be you're using equipment just to yank the whole shrub out of the ground. Uh, but yeah, that that root control is really important. Otherwise, it just sprouts back, and where you had maybe a one or two stem shrub, suddenly that's there's three times as many stems coming out of that that root collar after it sprouts re sprouts. So, um, it, yeah, we'll probably examine that biological control as more research comes out and see if there's a, a you know what exactly is the recipe to to make it happen. Uh, but until then, we're we're mostly sticking with those proven methods of either mechanical removal or, or herbicides. And um, Jamie, I don't know if you're doing different stuff there in Illinois. No, that sounds right. Um, all that's right on. I know I've seen biological control listed as one of our, on our payment scenarios, but I don't, I'd have to talk to the field. I don't know who else using it, if they've used it, um, anything behind that. So I'd have to look into that further. Thank you. John, any other practices aside of uh, what agroforestry practices that you've implemented through your programs? Um, no, I mean, uh, so our RCPP grants or funding contract, <laughs> whichever word uh, goes with that one, um, is, is funding uh, for us mulching around the trees, uh, the trees, um, the tree tubes if if they're required for or they're recommended for the certain trees um you know like our our raspberries i don't think are gonna get raspberries and uh blackberries aren't gonna get tree tubes but pretty much everything else is um the site prep we you know we did a deep tillage single shank pass and did some cover cropping um uh yeah, and then and then in that contract, we're also getting funding for a high tunnel, um, but that's more the annual vegetable side of things, and and high tunnels can fall in into that um, RCPP or um, they're more traditionally in a equip, um, but for some strange reason we we uh, didn't didn't uh, get approved uh, the last time we tried for equip funding on that. So we just looped it into RCPP and that that worked well. So um, it's, it's a, I think the same funding structure and amount um, in both those for, for high tunnels, but um, yeah. Thank you. Great. Well, we have reached the end of our time. Thank you all four of you for joining us. And if you want to drop your email addresses again in the chat in case people have questions um, about the programs, um, the recording of this webinar will be available soon on our YouTube channel. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And we're excited to work with you on agroforestry systems. 
Have a good rest of your day, everybody.